And I'm gonna let folks in. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining. We'll get started in just a minute. Just waiting for a few more folks to sign on before we get going. seeing a question about uh, recordings. Yes, we will be sending out information about recordings after the event. Okay. I think can I get a thumbs up from one of my co-hosts? Are we good to get started? Yeah. Okay, great. And uh, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's event. My name is Sasha Perotti and I'm an event planner here at MAPC. Before we get started, I just wanted to walk you through some tech um, details. You all are, you are all muted and will remain muted over the course of this event, but we invite you and highly encourage you to share questions and comments via the chat. Um, we will be monitoring the chat throughout the event. Um, so please do share any thoughts and questions that you have via the chat. We are also recording this meeting. We'll primarily be recording a speaker video, but if you would like to ensure that you are not recorded, you are welcome to turn off your video. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to message me in the chat and I will get back to you. Um, and with that, thank you so much for joining and I will pass to my colleague, Van. Good evening and good morning to some of you who joined this um, event. My name is Van Du and I am Senior Environmental Planner here at MEPC. Before we started, I would like to acknowledge that I am joining this event from Boston, the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts. I would like to pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past and present, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the people. So welcome everyone to tonight's event. Um, this is part of MAPC's Accelerating Climate Resiliency Program, which is made possible by the generous support of the Bar Foundation. The goal of this program, as suggested in the program's title, is to accelerate um, climate resiliency in the region. And with that, it means working with communities to deploy actionable interventions through local projects, policies, and strategies, facilitate long-term changes and readiness for climate change impacts, and advance climate equity, regional coordination, and social cohesion. As part of this grant, we have also put together or coordinate um, a resilience community of practice. Um, it's a network for grant awardees to share lessons learned, best practices, and also just support one another in, in this effort. Um, the speaker series is also part of the program, and every other month we invite experts and practitioners in the, in the field to come and join and share with us what they're perceiving and or how the solutions they are engaging in, in advancing resilience. So with that, I will turn over to my colleagues, Jeanette Pantola and Claudia Zerzua to kick off tonight's conversation. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Jeanette Bantoja. I'm a public health planner at MAPC, and I'm joining today from Portland, Maine, um, a central land of the Wapanaki. Um, this, the idea for this particular speaker series event emerged from a project that we have been working on for the last couple of months um, called Cool It With Art. So, 
Uh, for the last couple of years, MAPC has been deepening its work on climate resilience. And in the last two years in particular, we've been doing a lot related to uh, resilience to extreme heat. Our work in this space has exposed us to uh, many projects that take arts and culture as kind of a foundational element, resulting in projects that are more culturally resonant, engaging, um, have been effective in uh, tapping different types of knowledge in order to explore um, new forms of identifying what is an evidence-based uh, climate solution and intervention. And so we have uh, compiled a couple of resources that are now available on our website, um, including a slide deck of project uh, examples and interventions that we've found from across the country and an implementation guide in order to assist uh, municipalities, community groups, and artists in identifying opportunities to collaborate together in order to advance creative climate resilience solutions. We're really eager as an agency to support and highlight these types of projects and encourage you to reach out to us, um, either me within the public health team or our arts and culture department in order to either help you highlight the work that you're doing um, and for the rest of the region or to kind of get started on one of these uh, collaborative projects. So I'm gonna pass the mic now to Claudia. Thank you, Jeanette, and welcome everyone. My name is Claudia Zarazua. I'm an arts and culture regional planner. I am a Latina woman with glasses and a white background. I am joining you from Cambridge, the ancestral land of the Massachusetts tribe. I am now going to introduce our two wonderful speakers. Um, first, we have Erin Genia, and if you could wave Erin. Erin um, is a multidisciplinary artist and educator and community organizer. She spe specializes in Native American and, and indigenous arts and culture. She is a member of the Sisseton Wapaton Oyate tribe. And Erin has served as a city of Boston's artist in residence uh, in the Office of Emergency Management. I, I believe the residency ended just in July. A recent project of hers involved distributing cultural emergency kits, including health, wellness, and art items made by Native American producers, which we'll, we will hear more about today. Welcome again, Erin. And then we will hear from Sarah, Sarah Robottom. And Sarah, if you can wave. Um, she is a creative producer at Arts House in Melbourne, Australia, sister city of Boston and the lead project manager of their six year project, Refuge. Refuge, the project examines the different potential disasters that might occur in a city due to climate change. And it maps a creative approach to community preparedness. It brings together thinkers, artists, first responders and cultural leaders to explore social and community resilience in a more socially just and equitable way. Welcome, Sarah. We will first hear from Erin and her work, and then um, from Sarah. Erin. Thank you so much. I really appreciate being here with everyone today. I am going to present some slides to you now, so just bear with me for a sec while I share my screen. I just want to start off with a big thank you to everybody at Kudamaye. Um, thanks to the organizers and for um, and to Sarah Robottom for being here today. I'm excited to be in conversation with you. Uh, Erin Genia Imakyapi. My name is Erin Genia. I am a Dakota person. I'm a member of the Sisseton Wapitan Oyate of the Lake Traverse Reservation in South Dakota. And my pronouns are she, her. 
I currently reside on the traditional homelands of the Massachusetts people and within the traditional territory of the Nipmuc and Wampanoag peoples. Um, I'm really happy to present this work today that I've been doing over the past 15 months or so um, as an artist in residence with the city of Boston. And I have been working with the Office of Emergency Management as well as the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture to develop this multi-level framework called cultural emergency response. So um, I want to start off by saying, by sharing a little bit of my own work with you. Um, this is a piece that I did called Earthling, which is a performative character or alter ego, perhaps. Um, and I, I did this because as a, I've been a longtime community organizer working in a variety of different fields from ecological issues to economic issues to issues of social justice and was kind of always coming into um, sort of this paradigmatic conflict around my own perspective as an indigenous Dakota person uh, and bumping up against sort of the sort of dominant Western um, approaches to things. And I, so I have spent, um, many years trying to articulate a Dakota framework. And uh, through that, I have looked at um, many scholars and artists and thinkers that come from my tribe. And one of those is Vine Deloria Jr. And um, this is a quote that I think sums up so much about that um, way of thinking that Dakota people bring to, to, uh, to life. And so this, this quote, I'll just read it. The imminent and expected destruction of the life cycle of world ecology can be prevented by a radical shift in outlook from our present naive conception of this world as a testing ground of abstract morality to a more mature view of the universe as a comprehensive matrix of life forms. So I developed Earthling um, as a reminder that underneath our closely held ideas underneath the systems that capitalize upon us and colonize us, our adopted ideologies, that we are earth-based beings. And we're not just of the earth, but we actually are the earth itself. And we're part of the body of the earth. Our human understanding has come so far away from the reality that we are not separate from the earth. And so earthling is a way to kind of question or talk about how our responsibilities to ourselves, to each other and to the world would change if this reality was the basis of our collective thought and action. And if you, I think that if you look back in the historical record and beyond the historical record, that all of our cultures stem from earth-based ways. And yet those same earth-based ways have been targeted for destruction through colonization for hundreds, if not more, <clears throat> um, hundreds of years. And so, um, you know, I think, I feel that so much of my work is bound up in sort of thinking about how colonization has impacted us and has created the path that we're on towards climate change. And it's inseparable. Any conversation about climate change is sort of inseparable from this conversation about colonization and what that has done to the people of the earth and to um, indigenous people and to all colonized people. So um, I'm going to share with you a little bit more now about cultural emergency response. Um, so from my perspective as a Dakota person and as a community organizer and as a cultural worker, I perceive that the United States is in a state of cultural emergency. Um, and I also feel that as a society, we don't recognize it that way. And, and because of that, we don't have a way to deal with it at that cultural level. But really, in order to solve the problems that we face, we have to look at it at, at that level. We have to understand the cultural um, reasons for all of these things that we're facing, climate change, economic inequality, institutional racism, these stark COVID-19 disparities, the ecological collapse that's happening around us and, and indigenous people's dispossession. And so um, working with, the Department of Emergency Management over this past year, it was really a huge learning experience and I think transformative for me because as I witnessed the people in the office 
um, sort of spring into action to deal with this very serious public health emergency. And then all of these other issues were coming up um, that people were, we were, we were dealing with from climate change to um, the killings of, of black people by police to, um, to just so many other uh, emergencies happening. Um, I really tried to, I had a lot of time to, to think about why this is happening. And I realized that we need to have an emergency effort at the same level that the, uh, that the Office of Emergency Management operates to deal with our cultural issues. And um, so I, through this work um, as an artist decided to sort of uh, take the materials, the language, the operations, uh, the procedures of, of emergency management, which is a whole field and um, shift those from a creative perspective to think of, well, you know, how, what would it look like if we decided collectively that institutional racism for example, is an emergency. What are all of the things that we would need to do as a people in order to deal with it at that level? And so um, as I began to develop this framework, which is actually all available on the boston.gov website, which I'll share that with you um, when I'm done speaking, um, a lot of questions came up about what does culture mean? Um, uh, and, and how, you know, how, how could we do such a thing? And so um, I spent some time really thinking about like, well, what is culture? Uh, because as an artist, I often work in the field of arts and culture where a lot of emphasis is, is focused on uh, arts and, and um, sort of like the high arts of, of, you know, public art or sculpture or museums or theater, but not a lot is, is placed on culture in the larger sense, which can be defined as the rituals of our daily lives and, and our collective practices that are embedded, you know, within um, the way we think and our philosophies about how we approach the world. And so, um, so then, you know, I felt like it would be really helpful to create this website so that people could begin to have, you know, because begin to spark conversations uh, about um, how can we sort of start to address this at this level. And so um, in thinking about what is a cultural emergency, um, I would just say that it is a state of instabil instability and danger that converges across a broad range of people's places and events that stem from cultural practices. And through this particular art project that I did called Cultural Emergency Response, I really begin to implicate sort of the Western colonial foundations, those doctrines that also, that not only fuel our societal progress, but also create harm and lead to disasters on a huge scale. Um, and we're witnessing this across so many different fields and people are calling out for change and yet we have no real concerted way to deal with it. And, and looking back through history, looking at um, how things, how, how so social change happens through movements and things like that over the, over, especially um, in the 20th century, thinking of how, um, you know, there's, there's so much war and there's so much violent and nonviolent revolution. And, and yet, um, what if there was another way? You know, what if, what if we could embed um, cultural changes or shifts within our daily lives. And so that's something that I've been, you know, really, really interested in. And I think that we have to do it because these crises are beginning to magnify and we, we have to learn how to build those cultural transformations in to our systems. Um, so, you know, I would say, you know, as a Dakota person, I, I see very clearly, um, how these cultural foundations, these philosophical foundations, these ideological foundations cause harm to Dakota people and to indigenous people and to colonized people. Um, and, you know, looking back through this trajectory of colonization, that to me is something that 
it, through this residency, you know, I was thinking a lot about how Boston is an epicenter of colonization um, for this continent and how um, because of that, it, it bears some responsibility for kind of leading the way in perpetuating sort of these harmful cultural standards that have contributed to our state of cultural emergency and you know, thinking about some of those, those ways of thinking and acting that are so prevalent in our society, for example, toxic individuality and this separation of ourselves from each other and the natural world, um, this very hierarchical thinking um, and binary thinking and authoritarianism and sort of like, there's so many things and I, I actually have listed several of them or many of them as I see them um, on the website. So I'll be happy to share that. Um, but I think that we really need to begin that process of thinking about what are those ways because our thoughts do create a reality. How are the ways that we're thinking um, affecting the world around us? And I think one of the things that's a little bit different about cultural emergency response is that it does begin at a personal level because um, you know, culture permeates all sectors of life and it really does begin with our personal decisions and it expands to our familial interactions to our community activities. And there, from there, it goes on to the municipal, to the regional, to the national, um, to the systemic. And, you know, I, I have worked for, as a community organizer, as I mentioned, and I feel that it would be really helpful to those struggles to begin to think about how um, the culture itself um, can be held accountable. And what does that look like, you know, on all of these different levels? We have to hold, we have to hold our communities accountable. I feel like there's a lot of um, sort of idealizing of communities. And, and yes, we absolutely should um, be doing things at a grassroots level and, and solutions must come from a grassroots, um, at the grassroots level or from the grassroots level. But we also need to hold our communities accountable too, because um, we can still perpetuate many of those same harmful ways of thinking um, within our communities too. And so this, this piece here is something that I wanted to share with you. It's called Invisible. And um, it's about the cultural supremacy of Western, Western thinking. And as a Dakota woman here, I use the morning star symbol as a skin of, of protection to pr protect me from that cultural supremacy. So um, through the project, I um, began to think of how cultural emergencies could be addressed using the model of cultural emergency management and planning. And I feel that emergency management protocols and procedures are extremely powerful. They, they work behind the scenes, they marshal funding, they um, get resources and people together um, and every contingency is, is planned for, is, is they strategize for before an emergency, during an emergency and after an emergency. And um, so I think that that is a very interesting model that, that could be tailored to individual or community-based um, or place-based situations. And um, I feel that we already have, we don't need to really reinvent the wheel because there's so many movements, leaders, scholars, artists, community workers, people working in our systems and agencies and organizations who have already done the work of determining what um, the root causes of our cultural emergency are and, and are already enacting solutions. So, but a cultural emergency response can actually bring those ideas together, um, bring those practices together to kind of contribute to a more widespread grassroots cultural change that I think is required of this moment. Um, because culture permeates everything, uh, it impacts every level of society, every field of society from science and technology to economics, business, um, policy and, and administration. And so um, we have an opportunity to think of how culture impacts all of those things. 
And so I think for my role as an artist and a cultural worker, I've really been thinking of how I can begin to reframe the language and tools of crisis response to address this state of cultural emergency. Um, so I have a few, I've done several different interventions over um, the time of, during the time of my residency. And one of those I'm just wrapping up now is this cultural emergency kit giveaway for cultural emergency first responders. And so what this was, was I asked people across the city to nominate somebody who during the time of the pandemic had gone above and beyond in their communities to meet people's um, essential needs um, and cultural needs. And so um, I got, I was really just blown away by the nominations of, of folks who have stepped up during this time and put themselves at risk uh, to, to sort of, you know, people who are like essential workers and, and um, people who are um, creating uh, kitchens in their, in, out of their homes and um, putting together educators, who, people who are putting together um, supplies and, and necessary things for students and, um, and their families and uh, helping undocumented people uh, meet their needs during this time. So it was really amazing to learn about all of the different things happening across the city. And I think, you know, it's basically just scratching the surface of how people do step up and help each other um, when this, you know, when we're in a state of crisis. And this, uh, this gave me the opportunity to also um, make little, Things like um, I made little journals and other small items that went into this the little um, fanny pack that I designed. And I also was able to uh, order things from Native American producers um, because the pandemic has hit our communities, our Native American communities very hard economically during this time. So it was a, a small way to loop those folks into this process as well. Um, I also did some cultural emergency training exercises because training exercises is a big part of emergency management. So doing some tailored um, things around trauma, around water issues were a couple of the things that, um, that I did and they were both informative, but also performative. And then I'm working right now on this beaded cultural emergency response vest, which I just have like a short, very short, it over to Sarah and we'll get into Q&A after that. So please feel free to drop in your questions. Thank you, Claudia, for the introduction and Erin for sharing your work. It's really inspiring to see what you've been doing um, the urgency and vulnerability that you've been bringing to the last year of practice I'm like quite blown away by it. I'm really excited to talk to you after I've presented I'm really happy to be here tonight and have the opportunity to speak with you all um, my name is Sarah Robertam and I'm a creative producer currently living on unceded traditional lands of the Wurrung Wurundjeri people of the Eastern Kulin Nation it's winter here in Melbourne and the sun has just risen. So my lighting is a little bit better. And uh, we've just entered into our fifth snap lockdown due to COVID-19. So in the five kilometers that I'm currently allowed to travel from my home, a uh, place that I often frequent is the Burrarung River, which is a long and meandering life force that snakes around the city and has been cared for by generations before me. It's a constant reminder about the responsibility to care for country as it continues to care for us in these times. 
Today I'm going to share with you a key project that Arts House has been running for the last six years in collaboration with artists and emergency services called Refuge. Arts House, which you can see pictured here, is a key venue and program of the city of Mendy, Melbourne, which is the second largest city in Australia. We have a year round program of art and performances and present about 25 works a year. We also extend to do development residencies and long form research projects as well. Being a council venue not only affords us with stable resources for artists and also a producing and production team, but also the ability to connect with other departments at the City of Melbourne. And this has been a huge advantage for running a program like Refuge. It's enabled artists to be part of emergency exercises and join writing teams for scenario planning to connecting artists to climate change, resilience, health and wellbeing and park ranger teams. When Refuge started in 2016, the former artistic director of Arts House and Harold Wynne Jones wanted to build a community around the problem. Arts House based at North Melbourne Town Hall is also a designated emergency relief center. So the questions were asked, what role will we as a civic space have in preparing local community for climate catastrophe? How can we and our artists be involved in the planning for such events and help build community resilience? And who else do we need to gather? The family tree of refuge is vast. Emergency services, SES, Australian Red Cross, each committing to the program and its five year trajectory from the outset. Representatives from these agencies have been key players each year, alongside artists, First Nations elders, scientists, policy makers, community leaders. Each year they participate in a lab, which brings together all stakeholders in a collaborative format, scaffolding a repository of learning, knowledge sharing, food, and relationship building before the public event. The lab is a crash course into each other's worlds, a way to form trust and understand each other beyond the uniform. Last week, I was talking to a senior Bunwarung elder, Nawi Carolyn Briggs, who's pictured on the right chair here, looking at us with her hand like this. Nawi is a descendant of the first peoples of Melbourne, the Yalakut Wollum clan, the Bunwarung. Ani has been involved in refuge since the beginning welcoming us on the steps of the town hall as we led our first exercise in preparing for a flood, right through to being a collaborator on multiple projects. She said to us, Refuge has built a sense of family. It might be an organic family, but it's given me food, a platform for people. It's important to maintain refuge and that gathering, the intersection. The two never come together unless we're put into this situation. For the emergency services personnel that have been involved, Refuge has been a place for them to experiment and think of ways to engage community beyond command and control approaches. For Steve Cameron at Emergency Manager Victoria, it's been a case example of how a locally developed community approach might look. I'm gonna take you now through a snapshot of Refuge over the years and point out some examples to give you a sense of how it's played out. Each year, Refuge has explored a different climatic event. These events are then practiced and evaluated, gaining evidence that is useful in a number of ways across the arts, emergency fields, council and research-based practice. In 2016, we took the format of a simulated emergency exercise and imagined a local flood, transforming the North Melbourne Town Hall into a relief center for 24 hours. Artists and emergency services ran a series of exercises and activities for the public to take part in day and night. Each of the refuge artists explored a particular element within the emergency relief center. Sleep, communication, light and warmth, food, well-being, or community. Since 2016, Australian Tongan artist Lataya Tomapiao has attended Monday night training with Footscray's SES and participated in drills. This knowledge has helped her make live performance art in service of communities to make things palatable and accessible. For Refuge 2016 and 2017, Latai collaborated with SES to create Human Generator 57, 
and visitors were asked to be physical contributors to the collective energy of the Relief Centre, allowing their bodies to supply organic power. Part board game, part obstacle course, HG57 was a stark contrast to non-renewable resources of energy, which only result in the harmful effects of climate change. Over the 24 hours, cubby houses popped up all over the building made by children and family, housing music that inspires a sense of safety and hope. Led by artist Kate Sullivan, in these spaces, it was where Red Cross moved away from their information tables and pamphlets and instead spontaneously guided people through the space and started talking about emergency preparedness in different ways. In 2017, we envisaged the increasing possibility of five consecutive days over 40 degrees. Collaborating with Red Cross, SES and other services, Dave Jones' project Spalter was a tactile exploration of an extreme heat scenario. A young team of collaborators constructed a room-like model apartment block and subjected it to halogen heat wave. As the space heated up, the exercise was to determine how the residents would prepare and respond. The first and second year exercise also involved a sleepover component with the public invited to help run the relief center alongside volunteers, services and artists. From deciding how to arrange the sleeping environment to contributing to the workload of a relief center, the sleepover embraced a collective exchange through the night and into the morning. In 2018, we examined a pandemic event and what happens when the risk of contagion means you would never bring people together. Moving away from the Relief Centre model, Refuge became a program of events over a week. Artist and gamer Harry Lee Shang Lung undertook a residency at Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity to create Isolate and Contain, a live interactive experience inviting people to step into the control room with epidemiologists to map how a rapidly spreading virus might affect Australia. The exercise asked, what happens in a pandemic? How do we survive and support each other when we can't come together and contact is forbidden? How can we learn from the past and strategize from the future? Groups of people were faced with moral dilemmas, much like we are seeing today. Who gets the vaccine first? Who do we need to protect most? How do we keep connected? Based at a local school for two terms, Kate Sullins in case of project invited students from St. Joseph's Flexible Learning Centre to create personal preparedness kits that emphasise the micro planning and stamina that young people need on a daily level. Taking inspiration from the Australian Red Cross Ready Plan and Get Packing kits, the students made their own versions containing comfort food, comfort music, alongside cubby houses to take shelter in and banners that might ease the tension in an emergency. In 2019, we examined displacement prompted by climate crisis and reflected on Australia's own history of colonization. Housed in a temporary architecture constructed from masses of salvaged tents, Keg D'Souza's School of Displacement emphasised that learning should not be confined to institutions and instead become a more inclusive, accessible and connected more to community. Dispossession, water rights, Indigenous survival techniques were topics of discussion and everyone in the tent was invited to take part. An example of a community-led project in refuge is by 87-year-old North Melbourne historian Lorna Hannon, who's pictured here. Lorna and her band of locals have run Roof Crow Corner since 2016 as a drop-in space where you can meet your neighbours, quiz experts and throw up new ideas. Named after local humanitarian and environmentalist Roof Crow AM, this cosy nook embraced the motto, great things can happen when we talk over a cuppa. Over the years, Roof Crow has involved mask flinging activities, Ethiopian coffee ceremonies, tree mapping, tea leaf reading, 
and neighbourhood walks through North Melbourne. As we continued refuge into 2020, the hypothetical became reality. We were no longer hypothesizing a pandemic, we were in one, seeing the very cracks in community becoming amplified as power became dangerously centered into the hands of a few. This year, we looked at what happens when these crises meet and there is a convergence and overlapping of climate emergencies. Refuge 2021 moved beyond the release center model and took place over a month with online and offline activities, expanding the accessibility of participation. Jen Ray's shelter to camp asked, what could a Melbourne centric disaster shelter look like? Collaborating with First Nations master weavers, shelter to camp explored ways in which communication and community are central to notions of survival. Over five days, local community from neighborhood houses were invited to work alongside weavers, SES, Red Cross, and learn skills of hand building, knot tying, binding, and grass weaving to, be, to build a series of shelters. These are the final pieces. Lataya Tamapeo continued her relationship with SES in the sixth year to, con to contemplate the reality of forced relocation of Pacific people from their submerging island nations. Mass movement started with a walk at sunrise and culminated in a mass exercise drill of 100 bodies and drumming, amplifying a climate emergency distress call from Pacific island nations of Oceania. I hope I have been able to illustrate some insight into refuge over the last 10 minutes and what the role of artists can be in exploring emergency preparedness. A key thing that we did through refuge was that we discovered we learned by doing things together. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Thank you both for um, sharing on your incredible work. I'm gonna get the uh, question and answer started by asking the first question, but I encourage you all to please um, start adding any questions you have for Aaron and Sarah within the chat and um, we'll be monitoring them and then Claudia will um, be asking those questions. So. I'm just going to start with the first one. So our work and yours demonstrates that there are roles for artists um, in climate planning and disaster response. Uh, as climate impacts accelerate and the need for uh, response is more urgent, uh, what should artists bring to these issues and how can cities and towns create an inclusive environment for collaboration with artists and creatives. That is a great question and I'll, I'll take a stab at it. I, I think um, over this past, these past few many months working with the city of Boston, I realized that I feel that every city should have an artist in residence. Every organization should have an artist in residence um, because artists do essential work. And I think we saw that so much during the pandemic that the artists were the ones who were helping to keep people's spirits up and, and helping to uh, process um, so much of the trauma that was happening and to provide even you know people with an escape from the reality of the moment. Um, so there's so many reasons why artists are essential workers. Um, and their work should be paid. You know, I think it's really hard for art. I know that's really hard as an artist to survive. Um, and yet, um, you know, I do feel that artists have so much to give um, because we need creative solutions. We need creative ideas right now more than ever. We need to be thinking differently. We need to be challenging ourselves and artists are masters of that. And so um, I think, I guess I charge everybody to try to figure out how to create space for that within agencies and organizations. I don't think it's easy. I don't think it's easy to do because um, there are a lot of kind of preconceived notions about what art is or is it even valuable? Um, 
and you know then and then there's the logistics of it how you know how to do it but i think that those are questions that um you know that really deserve answers and um i i think that it can be done so i think it would be a great way to also bring economic um support to artists right now as well yeah i can't agree more with you erin i think um Firstly, yeah, artists are unwaged and they don't get paid until they are engaged in projects. And uh, I think that in this instance, it's not necessarily about making art or making a project in a conventional sense. It can be as simple as having a seat at the table and being part of the conversation. Um, artists are amazing lateral thinkers and collaboration is second nature. Um, most artists who work in a kind of interdisciplinary sense, they're very well versed in um, working with teams and um, identifying um, potential issues and seeing possible solutions. And I also think they're amazing provocateurs as well. Um, so I think, uh, you know, in doing the work with Refuge, you know, we've seen how um, bringing together artists and emergency services and, you know, community leaders as well in, in encouraging a conversation between the diversity of those people. Um, there is really amazing things that can happen from even being in the same room together. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you both. Um, I see there's already a few questions in the chat, so I'm going to take a stab at that. Um, first, I think this is for both of you. Um, what would you say to, I guess, local government and municipal staff um, that, you know, they don't see arts and culture place making as a priority for local government. As you both mentioned in your presentation, how integral art and artists are in, in policy. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think, um, I mean, what's unusual about Arts House um, being a curated venue at the city of Melbourne, it's quite unusual um, to have a program like this um, that is council run. I work for council, but I'm a producer and um, that is, yeah, it's, it's an unusual thing, but it's definitely something that um, I've seen happen around Australia and across the world as well. I would say that um, it's really important for, um, for councillors to think about how they might engage with artists through working also with arts organisations and partnerships as well, that um, sometimes councils aren't set up to engage artists directly and that a lot of benefits can come from partnering with arts organisations who can have the support um, of working with artists as well. Erin, I'm interested to know what your response is to this question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that's really interesting. Um, I mean, I, I guess like I, I should maybe, I did think I mentioned this, but I have worked in the field of tribal governance. Um, and I have, I have a master's in public administration and um, tribal governance. And I um, have worked in a field of native arts and cultures kind of at that level uh, for working with tribes. And um, I mean, I think that personally as an artist, I see that arts and culture makes us what we are. It makes us who we are as a people. So I think it's, it's a, always a priority. Um, however, I would also say that, you know, if people are really 
in a bad situation economically where they don't have health care, um, you know, those things take precedence. And for many tribal govern governments, those are the priorities right now because they need to figure out how to care for their people. And so a lot of times um, arts kind of, arts and culture kind of gets, you know, it's not, it's not as, as much of a priority. Um, and I think one of the things that, that my cohort and I talked a lot about during the artist residency with the city last year was that we didn't feel, it was, it was so bad sometimes during the pandemic, we were losing people and it was just, it just felt so awful on so many levels that um, we didn't feel like we could make art. We didn't feel like we could be creative. Um, we felt like we needed to roll up our sleeves and, and work on other things. And so I guess I would say that um, art has a very important place in all of this. And, but, and I think that it, it is a priority. Um, but I also think that, um, I, guess I, I guess I feel that, you know, that, well, I will go back to what you were saying, Sarah, that it doesn't, art doesn't necessarily have to be about a project or about an art piece, but in many ways, it's about the creative process itself and how artists think and like the solutions that, that come from that uh, creative process. And so those things can be very helpful when you're looking at economic issues, when you're looking at, uh, political issues and other, you know, and social issues. Um, so I think it's, yeah, I think that it, you know, we're kind of programmed to think, oh, we're gonna make, we see a sculpture or we're gonna see a painting, but no, you know, that's, that's not really um, necessarily the focus. Thank you. Um, and I think I can speak for most of the audience, uh, Sarah. Um, we have a question about what happened? How did you, what, once you did the pandemic in refuge, um, what impact you found it had on community preparedness during the actual pandemic, if any? I think um, for us, it was really um, clear to see the impact it had made on the artists that had worked in that pandemic year and also to the emergency services teams. Um, in the pandemic year, it was actually the first time that some of the services had met each other um, in the sense that if a pandemic happened, they would be working together um, and refuge kind of um, was a kind of point of um, uh, like a meeting point for some of these people um, who would actually end up yeah, working together during this pandemic. Um, I think the artists, um, I mean, artists are just so incredibly resilient um, regardless, um, but the artists that came through the pandemic year and actually previous years as well, because I feel like it doesn't actually matter what the emergency is. There's, it's the more you are prepared for a situation, the more likely you are to recover um, quicker and and have um, you know your knowledge base there for you. Um, I think the artists in the pandemic year became um, go-to people for a lot of other community members and a lot of other artists who were, you know, quite quickly becoming, um, uh, you know, fundraising and selling off their art. Um, to help support people or running their own, what Erin was saying earlier in their discussion around um, turning their backyards into um, food growing hubs. And some of the artists that have um, been through refuge also are um, doing other things in their lives. So some people work in food security, some people work in um, climate resilience. Um, they, they all come with different like a wealth of knowledge and community and different skill sets. Um, so a lot of people kind of went into action um, and were quite responsive in, um, in how they were going to um, 
continue to build a community and network around them and the resources that were available to them as well. Um, and to be honest, it was quite, it was worse than we had imagined. I think when we did the pandemic year, we were really cautious of not um, sensationalizing uh, a really serious issue. And I think that's happened across any refuge we've done. There's a real careful balance of um, doing these hypotheticals and putting the public in them and not sensationalizing really real issues and the huge systemic disparities that can happen between community members. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think I can speak for everyone. There's no way we could have prepared for this or imagine how bad it would be um, a year and a half later. Erin, um, I have a question for you from the audience. I think they, um, looking for the name Sarah. Um, she would like to know more about your initial interface with the city of Boston. Um, if you, before your work with them, had you already brought with you the seeds of using their protocols or systems as a framework for your work? Or did that only happen after your collaboration? That is a great question. And I think that the, the, uh, the answer is that um, it came through the collaboration, that the way that this residency program was designed with the city of Boston um, was that in the big, I guess in the beginning when they first started the program, they had an idea, you know, they had like something that they wanted tangible that they wanted the artists to produce. Um, but then they realized over time that, and they adjusted the program accordingly, that it was better if the artist just came, like did research about what the office was all about. Um, and then together in collaboration with everybody, uh, figured out, you know, what the project would be. And so that's how it played out, um, you know, with, in particular with cultural emergency response. I, did, I had no idea going into it. And when I'm going into it, I was a community-based artist to begin with though. And I had already had, um, you know, experience working as a community organizer and um, working with different communities and things like that. So I brought some skills with me, but the project itself um, actually came about um, because the cohort of artists that we, um, were in together um, also came together and would talk about different things. And um, each of the artists was sort of embedded with different um, offices within the city. So like um, Immigrant Advancement, Office of Immigrant Advancement or Office of um, Housing um, and other offices. So we would also like share our experiences. So it came about through that too. So I'm looking at the time um, and there are still a few questions in the Q&A that I, I think we will have to get to you via email. So we'll share them with Sarah and Aaron to share the responses with all of you, our attendees. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to Jeanette. Uh, Aaron and Sarah, if there are any other links beyond the ones I dropped in the chat where people could learn more about your work or even contact you, um, please drop that in the chat. Otherwise, I wanna thank everybody, well, first by thanking our speakers, but also thank everybody that attended uh, today's event. So th this webinar will be recorded. Um, one of my colleagues will share a link to where you can find the recording of the webinar after this event. We will also be sending it out. And I, again, want to encourage folks, this is momentum that we want to build within the region, work that we want to uh, see happening, uh, the type of co collaboration that we think will truly result in a healthier and more climate resilient Metro Boston. So if you are interested in doing this type of work and, or want to see your work highlighted, please 
reach out to us. Uh, you can contact our arts and culture department specifically. Uh, and this is part of a speaker series event. So just look out, there's another event coming uh, two months from now. Um, we'll share more information when we have those, that, those details to share. Um, so that's, that's it for now, unless uh, any of my colleagues wanna feel like we need to share anything. I'm getting thumbs up. So thank you everybody, have a great evening. Or to Sarah, thank you. Have a great rest of your morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.